and it says that we're live, but we're not really live. So don't, don't, don't feel like, you know, you're going to get canceled if you, if honestly, if we were going to get canceled, it would have been happening now. All right. Get that up. All righty. Michael, you all good over there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Here we go. In three, two, one. And welcome to episode 367 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Seth Troyer. Michael O'Malley. Uh, Nazi Algazwana. And Nazeeb, thank you uh, for joining us. This is your first episode. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about, you know, what we're here to talk about. Yeah, fans of Cinematary have probably seen Nazeeb's byline. Uh, you've written a number of reviews. You have one up on the site actually right now uh, da, 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 of O Vigilante. So, um, Yes, yes. Uh, wonderful, strange Brazilian movie that is on YouTube for anyone to watch if they want to. It's pretty short. Um, I'm a I'm a huge proponent of like 90 minute and less movies. I don't mind longer movies, but like short movies are my favorites. So that's why you're stats. here on the uh, on the uh, what is it hour and 20 minute long <laughs> movie episode. Exactly. No, exactly. Yeah. They're short and incomprehensible, and that's a perfect combo. Well, on, the, <laughs> on today's episode, we got movies that we saw this week in part one. And then in part two, uh, we'll be continuing Young Critics Watch All Movies with 1969's The Color of Pomegranates, which, uh, as I was telling Nazi before we recorded, um, easily the most unique of the movies that we've seen in this series and probably all of the other Young Critics series. So uh, it's going to be a trip. I'm excited to talk about it. But let's go ahead. Um, I mentioned his review, but we also got reviews of uh, vastly different movies from what we're going to be talking about. But we have F, uh, Logan Kenny wrote about F9, the latest Fast and Furious movie. And then I have a review up about the second Space Jam movie. Um, those are both on Cinematary.com. If you have not checked that out, head over there. And I know we'll have a new review coming up on Monday, I believe. Um, but let's go ahead and jump into movies that we saw this week. And... Michael, you've you've held you've had the people waiting. You know, we talked about uh, Tati a few weeks ago, um, and you've watched through the rest of his stuff. So um, I'm going to start with you with with that. Actually, wait. Yeah. Actually, hold on, hold on. Wait. Actually, we have a we have a we have mail. I, I take that back. Sorry, we're going to put Just Tati on hold for a second. The listeners will have to wait even longer. Yeah, you, you have to wait. You know, another another minute or two. Um, this one comes from longtime listener Ron Hayes. He says, "Hello, Cinematarians. Inspired as always to rewatch old favorites. After your discussions, I happened on a surprising bit of trivia regarding two films you recently featured. Unfortunately, I have a neurotic need to watch all the extras on a DVD." So after enjoying the apartment, I turned to the making of featurette and learned that B Billy Wilder had gotten the initial idea for the story while watching Brief Encounter. As Noel Coward's uh, story progressed, Wilder found himself musing about the friend who allows his apartment to be used for the weekly liaisons between Tre Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson. What was his story? Wilder wondered. How does he feel? How does he feel about that detail? And 15 years later, he told us. Um, P.S. How come Zach's cat never gets introduced at the beginning of the show? For those who watch the video, he and or she, it's two he's, uh, is a regular. I mean, I don't know. I can, he's sitting over there. It's Gigi. He'll, he'll come over in a few minutes. But thank you, Ron, as always, for the letter. All right. Tati. Thanks, Ron. Oh, man. Paying off weeks of buildup. Um, so if you guys who are listening remember i watched uh jordan bet a few weeks ago for this series and that was my first of like the mime turned cinematic comedian jacques tati's movies that i had seen um and Fair. so since i had watched it in um like that big old complete jacques tati um box set um which i had checked out of the library uh, i thought well i'll go ahead and just watch all of them um mm -hmm. And so I did. So I'm going to do like a quick run through of the ones rapid that I fire. watched. And yeah, just rapid fire because there's like <laughs> um, five or six of them. Um, so the one immediately after um, is uh, Jour de Fête is Monsieur Hulot's Holiday, um, which is about 
uh, the introduction of like I guess is like kind of famous like uh, character um, Monsieur mm-hmm. Hulot, um, and he's on holiday at this like beachside uh, kind of um, quaint village, um, and I really liked it. It was uh, a lot more what I had expected of Tati. Um, as people point out in the other podcast, uh, Jour de Fête is kind of like this, you know, really rural um, parochial setting, and that's true of this movie too but it's introducing a lot more of like tight gags and it has a much crisper like visual style where there's a lot more going on in each shot. You know, um, he's uh, inside this house that he's staying in like the attic of, and um, there's, it's, it's like a fairly elaborate, like, uh, uh, like setup for like uh, the floor plan and stuff like that. And that kind of pays off in like kind of gentle humor throughout. Um, And then like, there's a lot of stuff um, with the boats and the um, like just the ocean. Um, and I, I think like my favorite gag is like uh, Tati's uh, Hulo character is in this boat that um, it's like a canoe that like is slowly like kind of um, like doubling up um, mm-hmm. for, for various reasons. And like by the end, he's like encased in the canoe. Um, and it's just like, I don't know, it's fun. Like, uh, and it's also like a lot more visually engaging than um, Jour de Fête. And so for me, like, this is finally like, oh, okay. I'm, it doesn't make me more excited about Jour de Fête, but I can kind of see like the, the embryonic stages of that. Um, and then next, um, what he did was a film called Mon Uncle, mm-hmm. um, in which uh, Monsieur Hulot goes and visits his nephew who lives in like the suburbs of Paris. And this is like the 1950s. Uh, so it's like this extremely like mid century modern home with all these like, ridiculously um specific like electronic devices um there's like this really high high tech kitchen it's like very like you know uh mid-century sci-fi looking um there's like a this water feature in the courtyard of the suburban house that like people can turn on and off depending on who they want to impress um and uh this one i think is a lot more like explicitly um like thematically oriented than the other ones like the other ones are fairly like they're, they're mostly like strung together gags and there's like stuff that you could like pull out as far as um like themes like in injured effect like the whole like american like progress and speed and efficiency kind of ruining the mailman's job and stuff but um this movie is like very specifically about like this whole like suburban push and the like kind of consumerist like individualism that comes along with that and like Hulot's character and I have to assume Tati himself kind of hate this like really sterile suburban setting with like all these ridiculous appliances and like all these stupid like social mores and so he's like coming to rescue his nephew and take him off to Paris where it's cool um and uh I think that like I I like this one like this one is definitely like continuing the scale up in like terms of visual complexity um the house becomes like a real set piece and almost the entire movie takes place in the house like there's stuff outside of the house but um it it definitely like becomes like more of the what i had heard of tati which is like you know exploring like the absurdities of like mid-century architecture and modernity um and it's doing that um i think like i'm not like super connected with like the themes like it's not that they're bad themes but like when I think of things to criticize about the suburbs, like I'm not super, I, I mean, it, the suburbs look like shit, like no kidding, but like, I guess that's not what I have a problem with, with suburbs. And so it's kind of like, again, like uh, kind of gentle and not like super scathing, um, but at the same time, it's a lot more pointed. And I guess this like kind of coalesces in like the next movie, um, which is like the uh, like apex of his career basically. Um, and as far as I know, it kind of like, uh, cost him a lot of money to make because it ended up not being like super successful uh, and this is playtime uh which takes place like half in this like office building um and then the other half takes place in a club after after dark and um this is like the logical conclusion to like the arc of his like filmmaking career in which he has these like extremely elaborate environments that are like inherently absurd like there's cubicles in this office building where there's no door out of the cubicle. So you're just looking at like this whole floor of like dozens and dozens of people who are in like essentially like cubicle cages. And mm-hmm. So you just, it almost looks like a beehive or something, how they're all laid out. And like um, the movie is just full of this, like uh, it really uses this really rich 
deep focus so you can see really crisply everything that happens on screen. Um, and uh, you just watch characters just like little like mats, rats in a maze, just like scurrying around these like hyper modern environments. Um, and I thought it was like absolutely mesmerizing. Um, I said this on Letterboxd in my review, but I think that this is actually like not a very funny movie for a movie that has like a reputation as being a comedy. Um, but it kind of doesn't matter because um, I didn't think his other movies were that funny either. They're just kind of pleasant. Um, and this is like also, I don't agree with that. This uh, that funny. yeah, you didn't think it's funny either. Yeah, no, no, like they they are very pleasant. They're not like ha 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 funny. Uh, yeah, like, exactly. where, where's Waldo book? You know. But you had to have laughed at least at the gag with the with the doorman where the door breaks and then he's holding the thing and then he continues to open yeah, the door, which is an was, amazing gag. That was funny. There's also this mm -hmm. extended sequence when they're at like um, it's like a products expo, I guess, where they're like people are selling all these different products to put in an office or a modern home, um, mm -hmm. and like they have like these fancy trash cans that look like um, like Roman columns. I thought that was really funny. Um, but overall, like, I guess the appeal of this movie is more so just like looking at it visually and watching like just these really intricate things happen um, with the visuals. And it's again, like not really ha ha funny, you just these extremely like, choreographed character movements through these extremely artificial environments. I just thought it was like, just it had me riveted. Um, yeah, I mean, so, it's, it's one it's one also that like, at least I've seen it a handful of times now and it's just kind of like a nice, it is a pleasant movie to just like live in for how, like was it two hours long? Um, yeah, it's like two hours. Yeah, like it's just like a nice, like pleasant experience to be in for two hours. Now I will say like I've started, like I do laugh, uh, I do laugh pretty hard just throughout the whole, like the nightclub opening sequence because there are just like, you have those levels oh, of man. gags happening throughout that that kind of do set themselves up to be real you know you have like the yeah. the, the people the waiters who are like switching the coats you have like the whole back of the chairs is getting stuck on people you have the person who keeps like he like keeps frying the fish or whatever um but for like the for like the different person then you have like the dance floor keeps breaking I, that one and then you have the whole door the thing I, that one guy who mean. keeps wanting to like buy everybody everything yeah that's pretty I funny like that. yeah. okay I, I i'll take it back a little bit because i actually pulled up my letterbox review and i just remember my favorite gag in the movie is they're in a restaurant and there's air conditioning blowing against a woman's mm -hmm. back fat yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that is actually really good. Yeah, that that that's good stuff. It's just that all really... so absurd, and it just goes, oh, it just keeps going. M the majority so of the smart. movie, I'll say, is yeah, it's not like there's a lot of like laugh out loud, but um, I feel like he really comes to bat for the uh for the nightclub scene. So yeah, I yeah, I wasn't saying that there's like no jokes whatsoever, but like in a two hour movie, which is already fairly long for a comedy, sure. it's like a pretty low count of jokes um for even like a you know 80 or 90 minute comedy uh so it's not what i'm like there for but yeah every once yeah. in a while they pop up and they're good uh and then i'll go quickly through the last two because they're kind of i don't know i'm like, really sad that you didn't totally love traffic honestly you know i am too like so people may know I that trouble I, just, with it. I just hate cars like i i, <laughs> I hate driving right i back. hate just like okay. everything about um you know roads and and all that like i just hate it and so i was I saw that his next movie was Traffic, which Zach had already told me was, uh, you know, oh, I think you're going to like this one. And I just really liked Playtime. And I was like, oh, boy, here we go. I'm so excited. And I did not like Traffic at all. Um, I thought it was so boring. And I didn't know what was going like. I didn't know what I was supposed to be taking out of it, except that, like, like there's a few points. Like, there's a sequence in which, like, this dude is showing off like his camper basically like his car like mm -hmm. holds out into like a camping gear and i thought that was really fun um and then there's of course like car like just scene after scene of like cars driving and like things um like just these kind of uh really complicated like pileups of cars and like all that sort of stuff and like that's fine but one um isn't the end of playtime like a big car sequence yeah, they're all driving away. Like, yeah, they get they get in the tour bus and leave Paris. Well, yeah, and so like I thought that was really like interesting and cool because they're on like basically like 
rotating platforms like the cars like they don't even look like they're in motion they just look like they're kind of turning in concentric circles in playtime and so i was like ready for stuff like that and that didn't really happen and i realized that like i guess he was probably working with this much smaller budget it was like a tv movie um as opposed oh. to the theatrical release like i think it was um mm-hmm. uh i don't remember what country but it wasn't a french tv movie either um and i didn't connect with it at all i thought it was it felt structureless and there wasn't a lot like the visuals were a lot less crisp um and i just i don't know i just couldn't get into it maybe it's a maybe it's a gotta watch it another time thing, did, you know? did you enjoy the whole sequence when they go to the different people and they're all picking their nose in the cars yeah that was that I was mean, good that was fun. okay <laughs> I mean, oh yeah that's a good one um and then real quickly because i know i've been going a little long I'll, I'll hit parade which is his last movie real quick and that's like a super odd movie um so it's stylized like a variety hour. Um, again, it's a TV movie, uh, which I think was in Sweden um, or Switzerland, one of those yeah. two. Um, and the whole thing is it's like a kind of artificial variety hour in which you get like all these different people doing like acrobatics or singing or, or different performances. Um, and then Tati himself is kind of like the MC and coming out every once in a while to like introduce the new act or something. And it's, it's pretty meta. Uh, I saw someone on Letterboxd compare it to uh, Ingmar Bergman's um, the, uh, the Magic Flute, uh, which is another like kind of artificially filmed like stage play in which like there's a big like participatory role for the audience. Um, and I like this actually better than Traffic, although I think it's probably the least liked of his movies, uh, just because it's so weird. He's like experimenting with video as opposed to film stock. Um, Cool. So it's got that like really. Um, Ooh, like, I don't know. Talk to you ever did video. Is his last movie, and every once in a while he's like intercutting it with like thirty-five millimeter too. It's really weird, um, but it's got that it. look to it. And then um, I don't know, like there's like a probably like the last ten minutes of the movie are not even um, performance. <laughs> They're them taking down the set um after the the performance is done and like these kids are running around just kind of playing with the things that you just saw the mm-hmm. professionals um like using in the the variety hour and like i don't oh. know i like that's a really nice like thematic like book shutting moment for like his career is having like children play with things that like professionals have just done really elaborate things with them i thought that was sweet um it's not like awesome i thought there was like some dead time in it but i liked it better than traffic and it's like one of those like fun like meta movies to think about like in the context of his career uh, since it ended up being his last feature film um so in sh- in summary thumbs up on tati um some some highs definitely uh some some ones that i wish i connected a little bit more with but overall glad i glad i made the journey all right like well you know i'm glad you went through them all what's your fave out of all of them uh playtime for sure um, okay and then the Hard ones immediately before playtime, I also really liked. The one before playtime? The the two. So like Monsieur Hulot's Holiday and then um, Mon Uncle. Like both of those were good. Yeah. Which I guess is like the, that's like what most people feel, honest. Like yeah. I feel like that's the real consensus opinion. Is playtime is peak. Then you've got the two that were right before playtime. And then the others you can kind of mix around. Yeah, I watched Hulo's uh, Holiday over, like, shutdown, like, early into COVID, and it was very, like, cathartic and kind of mm-hmm. depressing, because it was, like, all these people on vacation having, like, a And it's a very, time. like, communal movie. Like, they're all, like, kind of rubbing shoulders with one another and in close proximity, which, uh, especially during shutdown. <laughs> yeah. Off the what is this? Yeah. Um, well, I believe, yeah, if you, you can probably find the, uh, the Tati box set from Criterion, but I, th- I think those usually pop up on the Criterion channel. And I've even seen Hulo movie or not, H- yeah, Hulo movies, you know, his Hulo movies specifically on like HBO Max. So, um, if you've not seen Tati, there you go. H- HBO Max has a, a very decent selection of like Criterion stuff. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It's a it's a shame their interface is just unusable. It's a it's a we it's a terrible interface. But yeah, it's 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 weird because you'll like see like playtime and then you'll have like a Ryan Reynolds comedy and you're like, what yep. the hell is this? The the, <laughs> the range. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many I could get roped in, just like, huh? I like this Ryan Reynolds comedy. Let's try the next on the list. Yeah, because I watched Free Guy. You know, I'm gonna go check out. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go check out uh, Mon Uncle. It's 
so, so what happens when like uh like the homogeny of uh all the studios and all the like yeah. the conglomerate the corporations so they just like like disney like that's why that's why it's so weird that disney has the simpsons like that's still weird to me yeah that no, that's weird. that is like, true <laughs> um you know like and it's you know like on hbo max i'll be searching around like in comedies and you'll have like you know you'll have like an adam sandler movie and then you'll have like you know a studio comedy from like the 90s and then you'll have like one of Chaplin's tramp movies and you're like what the hell yeah. like it's just, just like there's nothing wrong with any of these but it's just like, like it's a laugh, weird combo you know you'll, you'll just keep laughing yeah so um no it is strange uh all right well, Seth I'm gonna toss it over to you you had two uh two ones you wanted to talk about um yeah I was gonna talk about two Robert Altman movies Robert Altman is one of my favorite people ever um and like in hindsight, they were weird movies to watch back to back in his filmography because one of, one of them was Secret Honor, which is like his by far his most minimal like movie. It, there's like one character in the entire thing. And then Shortcuts, which is like second only to Nashville. He's like very well known for these like like dozens and dozens of characters in his films and just like mm -hmm. crisscrossing dialogue chaos like in a way like 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 tati with conversations i guess like in that way that it's like t totally like all over the place and you're just like watching chaos happen um but uh yeah so at first i watched secret honor which is philip baker hall who is amazing and is not in enough movies he, you may know him from Magnolia, Paul Thomas Anderson. He's the game show host. Who's he like was in Paul Thomas Anderson's first movie. Yeah, yeah. Heart Eight. Heart Eight as too. well. Sydney, and he's great. And in this, I think it's, uh, what year is it? It's uh, 84. He looks exactly the same age. He's like, <laughs> he looks so happy. He's been like 75 for like. 75 he has a very old years. face, yeah. yeah. I, I can't even imagine him younger. I know. I've I've like tried. I've tried to like search on Google for like pictures of him in his twenties, and they won't show them to me. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's on there, and he plays uh, Richard Nixon, who is like post Watergate. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, he's like post Watergate, like super depressed in his house late at night, <laughs> and he's just getting like he has a gun and he has a tape recorder and a bottle of whiskey and he's just getting progressively more and more drunk the whole time while giving himself like voice memos about the book that he's going to write about himself you thought he would have like sworn him. off tape recorders after yeah <laughs> that's the funny game. part and he's like like just vomiting up all of like the bile that is richard nixon throughout the whole movie like if anyone were to like hear this which we as an audience are privy to, we would be shocked. Um, but he's, there's literally no other characters. There's no other setting. Uh, it is based off of like a play. So it is like a, like a monologue. Uh, but Altman, it's, it's, it's still not, it's interesting because it's still not just filming a play. There's, there's some very interesting like cinematography choices and like weird zoom ins on like like security camera footage of him like in his house and stuff so it's it's very interesting i'm not like a nixon like expert or something but it, and you don't really need to be which you, you would think you would to like watch an hour and a half movie where it's just nixon talking but really like what it's about is like you don't really give a shit because philip baker hall could be playing any character just like listening to him like go like this is just really amazing. Um, and then to follow that up, I watched Shortcuts, which I hadn't seen in a long time, which used to be like one of my favorite movies. And it still is pretty high up there. But again, that's like totally contrasts with, um, it's based on the writing of Raymond Carver. They're all like various short stories um, that make up the ensemble. And they're all like intercutting and interweaving these short stories um definitely in robert altman fashion where he's you know taking liberties and letting actors improvise it has like a amazing cast like uh tim robbins is in it is it tim or tom 
It's Tim. Shaw- Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, mm-hmm. Tim. Yeah, uh, he he's he's in it. Uh, there's uh... now I'm blanking on everybody, but there's a, it's a great cast. It's a seriously great cast, and uh, yeah, Robert Downey Jr. plays like a really weird like he's totally coked out like as a character and in real life definitely. Um, and he's he's beautiful. I mean, you've never seen young Robert Downey Jr. It's like outrageous how what a good looking person he is. Um, the but, eyes, yeah. Yeah, the eyes are ridiculous. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's definitely less. Um, again, second to Nashville in the way that like the sheer amount of like amazing stuff going on, and second. To Nashville in the way that it's like maybe a little less focused, but it's still very interesting to watch like someone like somehow figure out how to interweave all these stories together. You can definitely see a through line with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia through the whole thing. Um, you can tell he was a huge fan. Um, uh, and yeah, that's I, I, I had a great time watching Shortcuts. It's pretty wild that you ended up double like featuring like uh structurally like opposite movies. <laughs> like one's literally like a bottle episode or a bottle film, and then the mm-hmm. other one's just like this massive, like multi like character like kind of thing. Um, yeah. Shortcuts I really needed at the time. I was like I won't get too hard into this, but it was I I was going through this whole thing where one of my family members like had COVID and I, I, I needed to figure, I didn't know if I had COVID or something. So I was like mm-hmm. quarantining in our, like we were moving right now. And I had like, I like slept in our old apartment that had like hardly any furniture and stuff just to like make sure my partner didn't get COVID and stuff. And I don't have COVID, thank God. But uh, nice. during those nights I watched shortcuts and uh, it, was, it was like, oh, all these people while I'm alone, I can at least watch people. Uh, was was secret honor in that as well you were just like i need somebody in the room with me here's richard that might have made it even more <laughs> it, it might have made me like even more like depressed i think i'm just like oh, <laughs> yeah, i was gonna richard say i don't think nixon richard nixon would help drunk in an empty apartment i think alvin's funny because he's known for like those big ensemble movies but then his movies that aren't the big ensemble movies tend to be extremely insular like three women or uh oh, yeah. images um oh my god these, images like, just yeah. these movies that are like extremely lonely where characters like have trouble getting out of their own heads and then his other movies are like we have 50 main characters and mm-hmm. they're all in this big old community with one another and constantly interacting with one another um i, I think it's funny that he just like swings in both of those directions he can do it all i've been staring at i, I haven't seen it yet or seen it before but i've been staring at the long goodbye which is on a couple different streaming services. Uh, speaking of another uh, Paul Thomas it's Anderson awesome. operation, uh, like yeah. Inherent Vice owes a ton to Long Goodbye. And Punch Love. Yeah, mm. yeah, that too. Yeah, I've been, I think it's on Amazon Prime. I've been staring at that one for a while. I might just uh, I might have to watch it. Elliot Gould is, is really good because he, he normally is really good. Get a Miller, just to get a Miller light and watch Long Goodbye. Really? Okay. Well, I can do that. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about my movie. We'll go ahead and just jump into the. We'll, we'll jump into the big stuff. All right. We're going to take a quick break, and then we will be back to talk about the color of pomegranates after this. All right. Sorry if you guys can hear a baby crying in the background. I My, can't. Michael, uh, you gotta you gotta tell the baby to that you're podcasting. Yeah. yeah. I read once that um back in uh like for uh, pioneers who were you know moving west in the in the united states uh it wasn't uncommon for them to like mix the like baby milk with like alcohol to like make the baby sleep so that they wouldn't Mm -hmm. like attract uh like undue attention as they were like you know of course like sneaking into occupied land and like whatever but uh I understand that impulse at times. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying we should do that, but like I totally get why they would do that. Like, what's yeah. what's a, what's a little like whiskey mixed in gonna hurt? Like, yeah, this baby, like it's gonna just like put him to sleep. It's just like the dumbest thing about babies is that they come out not knowing how to sleep. Like they'll sleep, but it's always by accident. 
Yeah, and, they're so like prepared for everything else, but they don't. They're not ready to sleep, which seems like extremely essential. Yeah, and it's like they'll be like so tired. They'll be just like, like you know, like not holding their eyes open, but they'll like, fight it. Yeah, somehow fight can't like figure out that like, oh, if I just lay still and breathe deeply, everything's gonna be better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure the first time I saw the alcohol thing was in There Will Be Blood at the beginning. Oh, yeah. Uh, beginning. yeah. He, gives D, he gives DW some as he's, like, next to, like, this fucking, like, mine. He can't drive, <laughs> you know. He's not going to hurt anybody. Yeah. I mean, doesn't... Not that we're giving you ideas, Michael. Just um, you know. Next time I'm like digging for gold and Jarvis or Posey. Yeah. Like you know, just causing too much trouble. I'll just be like. Yeah, like then then we'll understand. You know, whenever you're prospecting, like it's we understand. It's fine. Michael, is that your baby? Yeah. Yeah, I have two kids. That's awesome. Yeah, one is two months old. Who's the one crying? And then the the other one's two years old, and uh, he can go to sleep pretty well. He's oh. got it down. <laughs> He's got it down. Not in the mornings though. He wakes up super early in the mornings. It'll be like five five a.m. and he'll come out and be like, "I'm waking up." Oh, go get it! No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you you and your family, you can be like uh, what's his face in the uh, in the movie Greed. You can be out like you know walking around the desert, going yeah, going that, that sounds, route. That sounds terrible. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> awful. Are you talking about like greed from the thirties? The... That's what that's what we started this series with. So that's how oh, we that's off. right, that's right, that's right. I um I haven't seen it, but it's like I'm very aware of like its history and it's part of its like the real cut is gone and it's trip. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I I still want to like I still want somebody to just like do like a whole documentary about like the history of that thing because it seemed crazy. I'm shocked there is yeah. one like. Yeah, because it's like one of those like great like white whale lost silent films. Yeah, and like there's lots of docs on far less interesting films. Yeah, than right. Lost films. So I never heard of that one. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Eric von Streim is, is that his name? Mm -hmm. You ought to do a nice little Google a little Google search, Seth, and read about like the making of that movie. Like at one point they were in Death Valley and they couldn't get water, so they had to have like like they had to have like planes drop the water and they what? had to drop the water and then they had to have armed guards there to guard the water because they were oh, going crazy because it was so hot and they were like an attack it so they were like no we gotta like guard the water <sighs> like i was just like why are you making this fucking movie just go home <laughs> no <laughs> no that's 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 like i love that like crazy <laughs> Like you know, like Herzogian you know, yeah. like, to to like desire to make like this insane thing. <laughs> that's um, not. That's I just I I just recount the history of greed to people whenever I talk about movies. Now I'm just like, have you heard about greed? And then I just talk about the. I don't even talk about the movie. The movie, it's fine. I like the movie, but I'm just like, let me tell you about how it was made because it, it is, is crazy. Like, the backstory is. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah. Seth, have you seen Sunset Boulevard? Yeah. So, uh, the, the, what's her name's, uh, Butler. That's him. That's Eric Von Streim. Mm, yeah. That's the director? Is it really? No way. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ball, like her, his, her ride or die. Like, yeah, he, that's, that's him. That's Eric Von Streim. Um, oh. what, I, I'm so, I feel so bad for forgetting the main actor's name, the main actress. Is uh, Gloria Swanson. Yeah. 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 So, um, we had that one on on the list for like it's been on the young critics like on the ballot the last couple of years. I'm surprised it hasn't won because I guess I thought that movie was if you had said like what's the more popular mm -hmm. movie Sunset Boulevard or The Sweet Smell of Success, I probably would have said Sunset Boulevard's probably. Yep. It is. I would I would say that too. It's the um, most it's it's the more popular one for sure. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I think so uh, it's, it's always so weird when like. Yeah, it happened a lot more like back in the day, I feel like, where there were like these directors that just like, and now I'm just going to do a bit role for some reason. Yep, or they yep. like started out that way. Like the guy who was in, uh, who directed Night of the Hunter or whatever, wasn't he? Oh, like, Charles Lawton. Well, he, yeah, was he, was a, like he was a very well known actor before he did the directing. Right. It's just mm -hmm. weird. It was more, his, his was more like, oh, I'll just try to direct this time. 
everybody and he killed it and never did it again. And, and everybody was again. stupid and hated it at the time. Yeah. I mean, it is scary. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's shocking for its time, but <laughs> it always kills me that Buster Keaton is in Sunset Boulevard and he doesn't say anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man, it's been so long since I've seen that. I probably wouldn't have registered in the same way. No, he, I saw that shit. They're like playing some briefly. game. Yeah, he's they're playing like they're playing cards or something. Yeah, they're playing some card game, and he's yeah. just it's just his fucking face. But it's it's Buster Keaton. Keaton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, you know, refuses to make any sounds, you know, in the sound <laughs> film, right? Like, have you guys seen that Twilight Zone episode where Buster Keaton is in it? No, no. I didn't know he it's was ever in an episode. Really, it's really fun because it's um, so like it's Buster Keaton in like whatever, like the late 50s or early 60s, I can't remember. Um, and he like, I don't remember what happens. He like goes into a time machine or something like that back into the 1920s. And then the, the uh, episode becomes a silent film because it's back in the 1920s. And it just like becomes Fire. Like a Buster Keaton short. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah Fire. Is really well, fun. I love oh, any of the celebrity old. guest ones. The celebrity guest ones are always so good. He's, the... super old, he's not as acrobatic as like, you know, obviously he used to be, but it's still yeah. really fun. The um the local like rep cinema like in Minneapolis is called the Trilon. Mm -hmm. Um this month there's it starts like this weekend, they're having a whole series with Buster Keaton and Jackie Chan films. Oh hell like, yeah. Like That's like a Buster Keaton film and a Jackie Chan film on the same night. Cause I guess uh Jackie Chan was like uh, you know, the the they both have like he like they both all like are very physical and they have like their physicalities and so mm -hmm. and Jackie Chan was very much inspired by Buster Keaton. Definitely, yeah. Um, so the first one is uh, Project A, which I've been dying to see. I hear is amazing. Never seen that. Um, I haven't. I haven't seen anything like. Okay, Jackie Chan's so crazy to me because I grew up knowing him from Rush Hour. Sure. Like, no, Jackie yeah, Chan we have no idea. Just was synonymous me. with like like Rush Hour to me, like a dumb like early 2000s. I had no idea he was like a legend, like a total fucking legend. Shanghai um, Nights, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. He's like a crazy director, actor. Like, yeah, and he, and he has just like some of the most insane physical like choreography like ever. And any like I saw someone posted like a like a scene from Project A on Twitter. And they're like, like just like as an as a as a taste of what he does, and I was blown away by the by the just that clip. Have you seen a police story? No, I like like I said, none of, none of like the good stuff he did before he came to America. Oh, if they if they show police story, definitely do police story. He does like the oh, I'm seeing everything. That, yeah, the yeah, stunts I, he does I, in that one is insane. Yeah, I plan on going to all of them. Like, I'm so excited. Like, I've like what a great like pairing that I would have never thought of. Oh yeah, no, that's that sounds like. Are they showing like a Jackie Chan movie and like like doing a double feature of like Jackie Chan movie? Then you stay and you watch a Buster Keaton. Yeah, but I think the Buster Keaton ones are first. Mm, okay. Because they're shorter. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. and they were made first, I guess you know. Mm -hmm. So you see like the the like the OG like stuntman, sure. and then you see like you know what what followed him. And the really cool thing is um. We have there's gonna be like live music with the Buster Keaton films. Nice, yeah, 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 that's always fun. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm super grateful for this place. I like found it like a few months ago, and like I volunteer there now, and it's it's great. Like the programming's excellent. So yeah, wow. awesome. no, have fun with that because yeah, Jackie Chan, oh, uh, uh, you know, Hong Kong, Jackie Chan movies are the fucking best. Yeah, no, no one was doing action like them, and no one has, I think, since. So. No, it's going to be super fucking annoying in the next week or so, whenever that Marvel movie comes out. It's it's already out. I like I already have all of it muted on Twitter. Like I preemptively <laughs> muted every variation on the title. Yeah, and I do that with every Marvel movie that comes out, and that's no hate. I just I just it's just uh, so uh, much every time they come out. Yeah, like who, on my who timeline, just, who cares? Like what? Like it's not. Yeah. Like it's just not. It's not Hong Kong cinema. It's just it's a Marvel it, movie, guys. Yeah, and like I, 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 all the power to anyone who loves them. But like I can give a fuck. I can yeah. get a fuck about those movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they had some. They had some clip from it, like when they were promoing it, and it's like the guy, and he's on like a train, and pretty much. It, they set it up where they're just like you know it's they, they wanted you to be like oh it's like a jackie chan movie you know it's like police story it's like you know drunken master or something you're like no it's not because well, what, what, what this guy's not are, doing are they doing stuff. like uh iron fist or what is this no it's a uh, shang chi um 
Shang Chi and the Ten Rings. I don't know. The only reason I would watch it is to see Tony Lung, and I don't know if I'm like that compelled to see Tony Lung in a Marvel movie. So, you, you know what I just thought about? In the same way I discovered Jackie Chan through Rush Hour, children are going to discover Tony Lung through this, having <laughs> no clue who Wong Kar Wai is, right? Or that, like, or that he's like a giant, like you know star in china that like yeah yeah and right. he's in some of the greatest films ever made yeah nah he's like this guy in this marvel movie and you know what like that's just the way he's it goes bad guy yeah 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 and We're one day they'll grow up and maybe they will come cinephiles and like they'll be like oh shit this guy like had a whole back catalog that was just fire yeah it's yeah. <laughs> funny oh all right let's let's talk about some nice soviet avant-garde oh. cinema yeah it is nice it is it's the word i would use I, it is a good vibe it is vibes for days all right here we go in three two one and we're back with part two of 300, episode 367 of Cinematary. In this part, we'll be continuing our Young Critics Watch All Movie series with 1969's The Color of Pomegranates. Uh, written and directed, and excuse me, I'm just going to butcher all these r Russian names. Uh, written and directed by Sergei per Perajonov. Perajonov? Uh, the film stars so uh, Sof Sofiko Chiaruli, uh, Melkin Alek Sanyan, uh, Vilian uh, Galstayan, and Gorgi Gagechkori. Uh, the avant-garde film depicts the life of the 18th century Armenian poet and uh, musician Sayat Nova, uh, portraying events in the life of the artist from childhood up to his death. The movie addresses, in particular, his relationships with women, including his muse. Uh, Para Jonov, the uh, director, said his inspiration was, quote, the Armenian illuminated miniature, and that he, quote, wanted to create that inner dynamic that comes from inside the picture, the forms, and the drama, uh, and the, the drama of the color. Uh, he also described this film as a series of Persian miniatures. Uh, born Arutin Sayadian, uh, 18th century Armenian poet Sayat Nova, whose pen name means King of Songs, served as the initial inspiration for the film. Sayat Nova was an Ashag, uh, Ashaj, Ashaj, a, uh, a troubadour whose verses were uh, set to music that he played on a loop uh, because he wrote in three languages spoken, uh, Armenian, Azer, uh, uh, Azerbaijani, and Georg Georgian. Um, he has long been revered as a symbol of brotherhood in the region, as illustrated by his this stamp commemorating the uh, 250th anniversary of his birth in 1712. Uh, the director saw himself as a spiritual kin to Sayat Nova uh, and believed that his ties to multicultural Transcaucasia made, his, made him the ideal artist to bring the poet's life to the screen. Uh, for The Color of Pomegranates, uh, the director eschewed traditional biopic narrative, which is an understatement, and uh, focused on visual and sonic details. Uh, he stated that he wished to, quote, show the world in which the uh, Asajj lived, uh, the sources that nourished his poetry, national architecture, folk art, nature, daily life, and music will play a large role in the film's decisions or pictorial decisions. Uh, he played a lot. He placed a lot of importance on filming at historical locations that had been important to Sayat Nova's life, uh, so, such as Hakpat uh, Monastery, where the poet had lived as a monk in his later years. Though many of the religious props seen in the film were rare artifacts, Parajonov uh, uh, added his own personal touches. He designed a number of the costumes, including the green dress worn by the angel at the film's conclusion. Uh, the film was originally going to be called Sayat Nova, uh, but Ger uh, Gervor Karian, the chair of the uh, studio in Armenia, decided too many liberties have been taken with the subject's biography. Because of its displeasure <laughs> with the film's unorthodox take on his life, uh, Gaskino, the, which is the studio name, refused to let it be shown abroad. It wasn't until the mid-1970s, while the director, Parajonov, uh, was imprisoned, imprisoned on charges of homosexuality and dissemination of porn pornography, 
charges that many insist were politically motivated by his association with Ukrainian dissidents and public criticism of various Soviet authorities. But the film appeared in the West in a bootleg print. Uh, the breakthrough, this breakthrough happened after film scholars such as Herbert Marshall championed the work and protested his incarceration. Um, the one uh, review I could find was from a filmmaker, uh, Mikhail um, Veritov, who said, beside the film language suggested by Griffith and Eisenstein, the world cinema has not discovered anything revolutionary new, new, revolutionarily new until the color of pomegranates, not counting the generally unaccepted language of Boomwell. Um, so on that note, we got... I'm, I'm excited to get into this discussion. We have two uh, who have seen this before and then two uh, who have, this is the first time, including myself. Um, but yeah, um, Mizzy, I was gonna, I was gonna go ahead and start with you. Um, you had seen this before. So what's your, what's been your experience so far with The Color of Pomegranates? So second time around, uh, just as un incomprehensible as the first time to be honest i can't imagine it gets better i mean it, like in terms of like the visuals it gets probably gets better but in terms of like mm. understanding i don't yeah think my thing probably... with them like trying to censor the movie is like i don't even think you guys got it like yeah. you guys can't know enough well, to censor this thing it, well i i wouldn't be surprised if that caused them to be insecure which caused them sure. to sure. to like censor it because I can see them thinking, okay, if I don't understand this, then I might be missing something that's yeah. like offensive to the state, the culture, whatever. Totally. Um, and what's really depressing is they probably love like modern day biopics. They'd be like, yeah, these are great mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're like super by the numbers. They go through a person's life. They're really sterile. Like, like um, they would have, uh, they wouldn't have cut a single thing. I mean, they would have given like like um bohemian rhapsody like that'd be an ideal movie for them maybe big know? fans yeah. of bohemian rhapsody yeah, Dark yeah, tower yeah, yeah they'd be like right. why why don't you just dress up like uh, gary oldman you know you should have done that yeah movie. just like all these really like by the number yeah. um you know biopics but it's funny that like between this and andre rubelev mm -hmm. like the soviets are super super good at like mythologizing their history and like yeah. faithfully depicting it and they oh. like they're very very nationalistic, and they do so through artists too. Like both this mm -hmm. and Andre Rublev are about artists. Yep. Yeah. And uh, That's so, a a, 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 according to the Soviets, and as far as I'm concerned, like the best way to make a biopic is to not present the people in their life and the events that happened, but to present like the entire world in which the artist lived. Mm -hmm. and like present the entire like environment that they were like inhabiting because that's really like what forms a person um but it's very hard to do if you don't have a plot that is going anywhere right because there's no plot and there's no like place to go mm -hmm. and uh that's very difficult to like get into the rhythm of i think when, when as like a casual moviegoer or when you just start to watch art films mm -hmm. um like I love it a lot. So I watched this like six years ago. I was just getting into film and it kind of just washed over me and I knew it was amazing, but I didn't know why. And now when I watch it, it's one of those things where it's like, um, there's nothing really to get other than being someone who's not from this country or culture and you're simply observing it. And so it's not anything that's too deep for a person, at least for me, it's just like, you know, you're just, I'm a Westerner. I'm from the West, you know? And so like, of course it's going to be foreign and like alien to me. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the best movies that are like really artistic and have a lot going on um, can be enjoyed regardless of context and history, right? Mm -hmm. I could never know a single thing about this guy's life and the movie would be incredible every time I watch it, no matter what. But if you want to get into like the context and like the history and like what's going on, like, it's rewarding in that capacity too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, Seth, you'd seen this before. What was what was it like uh, coming back to it for this? Oh, it just slays. It's just man, it's so amazing. It uh, it is stands on its own. I can't imagine seeing this at the time. It's such an. It is uh like, like you said, Nazi. It's like being. I think it is like the thrill of being in another country or something that you've never been to mm -hmm. uh, for a Westerner 
um, or anyone outside of this culture or this history is just sort of like it it I could imagine it being daunting for like a first time viewer westerner mm -hmm. but I, I would I would encourage viewers to go into it like like you would going into another country and being like you don't get this you don't know about this but it's like it's it's good for you to like just kind of bathe yourself and go head first into this um and just like the it reminds me of like like modernist writers or like um or like uh like 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 a Joycean or like uh, like almost like a pension kind of like layer mm -hmm. cake where you can like just be you can you can enjoy it. The trick is that you can enjoy it. You can get through books like those or movies like this and not have a clue of like what exactly you saw. But if you wanted to, you could go through like every scene. Like I think we were talking earlier. There's a a, a Criterion special feature on like the DVD or on the channel that goes through a lot of this and explains a lot of things. But like each scene feels like there's like several layers of symbolism happening. You could just read for you could read like several books about it, which is very exciting, I think. But again, it's not the prerequisite to, for enjoyment. It is like the colors are great the the like choreography is amazing just like on bait on a basic level of just like the only thing i could really like it was interesting to hear that quote from a early reviewer that you had zach the only thing i could like i just assume he hasn't seen it, kenneth anger that's the only thing i could really compare this to yeah. is like which is kind of bonkers that like inauguration of the pleasure gnome came out before this kudos to kenneth anger as usual but th that's the only thing i could like draw a comparison to as far as like a contemporary film doing this sort of like moving art pieces rather than actual movie dialogue scenes mm -hmm. yeah the movie that came to mind for me watching this and obviously this is after this but um like Derek Jarman's movies, like specifically Last of England feels a lot like uh, mm -hmm. this movie. I would be shocked if this wasn't like an inspiration. Uh, for I was Robert thinking of uh, of uh, Caravaggio, which we, yeah, we talked too. about. Mm -hmm. Although I think that's like maybe a little bit more narrative. Than it's much more narrative, but it like, it, it. I think it kind of, it it has those sequences where it's like set up like a piece, of, like, like a painting or a piece of art where it just feels like it's that, but like alive. Um, yeah. There's a lot of sequences oh, like that. I think well, I that's a great comparison. Like... Uh, I think that's a great comparison. I like that, that, that reminded me that like, that was one of the things that I liked about this that is totally Jarman like that, like for all it, it's hype to being like an incomprehensible, very artistic film. It has like a weird punkiness, like kind of like, there's kind of an irreverent, like the way the cuts work, the way the costumes work sometimes. There is sort of like a, like ragtag sort of not giving a fuck kind of feeling that mm -hmm. almost like Caravaggio has like on purpose. Well, and even like just the, just being kind of agnostic to the actual facts of the subject's life, I think is like, I don't think it's irreverent in the sense it's like, you know, tarnishing the legacy of these artists, but it is, irreverent in the sense of like just we were talking about how it's not there to ratify um like the person's biography it's more there to uh, be resonant with the larger ideas of their career or i assume the larger i don't know a thing about this, this uh, armenian troubadour uh, so i'm not going to claim that i do um but like to me it feels like um the resonance of the movie is that it uh, is in conversation with the larger resonance of his importance and career um, rather than like we want to kind of relive like through like an audience surrogate character like what it was like to be around that person like which is like what i feel like a lot of biopics are doing is like i wanted to be in the room when that happened mm -hmm. um yeah i i never i never understand like why modern biopics just like insist on being linear Cause that's almost like a waste of the medium of film. Like the whole like beauty is that you can cut to like the most exciting, the most important moments. Right. 
Mm-hmm. And so, well, I got to say that there is like that trope in biopics where it's like, you know, um, Dewey's got to sit down and think about his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. I, I guess it's like a very simplistic, like, uh, it is what is very simplistic, non linear kind of structure. Um, but because, like, like life in its totality is like pretty boring. Like, like instead, like Perzhenov like takes these like tableaus and like just presents them. And I was talking to Zach about this earlier, and it's like a cumulative effect where it just like it's it like builds like little little by little by little, mm-hmm. and you just get an overall picture like at the end of it. And that's just more interesting. That's more engaging to watch. Well, and I think. Well, you have... Oh, go ahead, Zach. I was going to say just, you know, to your point, Michael, I think also, I think it's much more effective to like try to tell, try to try to evoke what the the person like, you know, like what he was trying to to pass on or what he was trying to kind of evoke through his own art, you know, through the biopic rather than just going you know, it's, it doesn't need to be like a, let's experience what it would be like to, you know, you know, that's, that's why I kind of roll my eyes at, at something like darkest hour, because it's literally just like pornography for world war two fans and Winston Churchill fans to like see, you know, a scene, you know, something that they've read about in in books and heard about in in other things like acted out. And I'm like, but you're not going to gain anything from that. You're just, it's just kind of like, you're just seeing something to kind of get off on it almost when, you know, if you really want to like understand this person, like you got like something like this movie where you, you're not like, you're not getting, there's nothing that maybe you'll latch on to because it's something you'll recognize, but it you'll, you'll be enveloped in like what this person's mind was like. And I feel like that's probably, that's just much more effective even for, for movies. Well, yeah. and it limits the movie too. Like, you know, when you're telling like the story mm-hmm. of Winston Churchill or Johnny Cash or like whatever, mm-hmm. um, and you're, you're sticking to like a literal interpretation of their life. It like limits what you can do. Whereas in this movie, like, when the guy is born, there's a whole recitation of like the passage of creation in Genesis and like all these like free associative like religious images there. And like that is so much more interesting and like <laughs> rich than like to see him born and like whatever happens in early life in like a literal way. Like there's like the movie just opens up once uh, you're allowing yourself to not worry about like kind of walking through literal events and instead you can just like. You know you can have an angel show up or stuff like that like i it's just you know just so off the wall um mm. and, and yeah really, i agree with zach like, that it is so like it is about like as a viewer feeling what it's like to be this poet like like living inside his head like we you might not be religious but like through this you kind of like see like obviously he wasn't like hallucinating like all the time but like this is in a way like the the reverence that is had for religious iconography and like the belief that like like angels are that are there Mm -hmm. is like literally shown in this movie as he goes through his life uh which is a really like way more fascinating way of doing it rather than just like having a character like a person playing him and having a monologue about like how how he what he believes and how he feels like yeah or just affirming like what you would expect this figure that you know to to say uh nizzy you were gonna say something oh um yeah it's, it's related to what all of you are saying um it's so much of like what affects us in our life and what shapes and molds us are just like things that we experience either emotionally or psychologically mm-hmm. and uh you know that is what i feel like a lot of soviet uh filmmakers were really yeah really sensitive to um like the the physical events that happen to us are like much less uh, formative than you know like our inner thoughts or our like childhood memories um there is a scene early on that i think is just so striking where he's a child and he's being told to read and he's on like like this like stone bridge like outside Mm -hmm. and there's all these books open around him and and the wind is blowing it and 
it's beautiful because it's a natural thing that occurs. It's wind, but it look they look like ghosts. Like it looks like ghosts are turning the pages of these books, and he's just like surrounded by like all of these like um, phantoms of like Georgian Albanian history. And like again, like these Eastern European countries are just so in tune with their country's history. Like the it's like it's it's very much built into like their interiority. And I don't know if that's like a result of like like living under um like the Soviet Union. I don't know if it's like a propaganda thing, but it's very uniform and very lived in in a way that uh I really enjoy experiencing. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's there's there's something about like the reverence of not just like when you, you know when you say the history it's not even like the like moments or stories around them it's like the stories feel like embedded into the land itself it's like they're engaged with like that like that culture it's not just like you know I think um, you know I think a lot of American culture um, is just so it's so embedded in like mythology. It's so embedded in like the stories and the figures that were, that we recognize. And in this, it's like, you have that because, you know, like Seth was talking about, you kind of have like this iconography, this religious iconography that pops up a lot, but it's always in service of like the kind of embedded, you know, cultural, like what, what is around you uh, that you can't see kind of, um, I think that reverence is, is what's what's kind of in tune with this movie. I wonder if that's like a consequence. I mean, this is maybe like BS, like psychologizing of a national identity. But like the United States has no history, like in the sense of like a European country would, you know, like it, you know, there, you know, for for like the majority of the people who live in the United States, like, you know, you're not indigenous to the region, like at mm -hmm. least like, you know, a couple of generations back, like the country itself like the topography of the land is only associated with like the last like 300 years or whatever in our like popular consciousness right there's no like there's no deep root because like that was like consciously like uh you know genocided and erased and yeah that's really like, true the experience of living i've often thought about this like like because like you know national identity for the united states is kind of like inherently like white supremacist in the sense of imperialism like, yeah mm -hmm. it's in, it, because the entire country's project was that but if you lived in like i don't know i think about ireland a lot you know because like you know o'malley is irish um of course but like i think about like there's a national identity that kind of transcends like a state like an individual state there mm -hmm. because you know you're uh your tie to the land is not simply a function of that state existing and um, I think maybe like a film like this, another, you know, a film like um, Andrei Rublev or uh, Mirror, you know, the Tarkovsky movies that deal a lot with history contend with that as well, because you see like the the state power that's, you know, in charge of like his land or, or where the family is living uh, shifts over time. And so it's not like, you know, I'd obviously like government is an important part of the person's identity, but uh, it doesn't have to, like there's there's a there's a broader canvas there with with countries that aren't like settler countries, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you also have, uh, you know, what's interesting about the, that the film and kind of what it does is it also has, you have these, these, you see similar faces over and over again. You kind of see people playing different, like they're playing different characters, but it's the same actor. Um, and yeah. you kind of have like that continuation that 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 familiarity because you see the same person playing three different characters um and it kind of creates this this uh this kind of binded connection yeah i think that woman plays like five actually like five mm -hmm. characters in the movie which yeah I, I love when they do that if they do it yeah. like well <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's like a it's like a it reminds me of uh osamu tezuka who is like a like he's like the godfather of manga, um, who invented like Astro Boy, and throughout his mm -hmm. he regards his uh, like the way he draws certain characters they are his, like members of a, of his cast, and they are used like you will find like in other books like Astro Boy is like a different he's playing a different character or something, but they are like but they are all like parts of like 
different parts of like the same archetype and i wonder if that's what's going on here like there's like the old man there's the old the, the woman the angel like it's kind of mm -hmm. interesting to see that that's the only other place i've seen it like that yeah i think it's just like you know it is it, it's just again going back to like it's just kind of this connective tissue of like this it's it's one it's just familiar and two it's kind of like yeah like they're carrying over to each part or each step in this person in this man's life like it's just something that he kind of goes back to it's just like this 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 familiar face um that he always that, that that's kind of just always there and he also is not only seeing like familiar faces of like different people but he's also you know engaging with like his younger self and his middle-aged self and things like that you know when he gets old you know near the end of the movie he's like seeing those as well it's just kind of like that's the 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 movie like the movie's so interesting because it kind of feels like it's you know because there's no like narrative structure there's no like first second and third act it feels like everything's just kind of like on top of each other and like i don't know to me that's kind of fascinating you know it's like you could you i mean you there is a there's a linear order that you kind of because he starts as a child and he ends as an old man but like at the same time you could probably pick up anywhere and it's all about like the experience along the way yeah um I, I use this term lightly, but I think it is applicable here. Um, it is very much structured like poetry, you know, yeah. like mm -hmm. it's it because um, it kind of just jumps throughout time and like emotion. And uh, that's I, I, w I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't unintentional on you know his part. I I'd be very interested to see what the poetry of this man is like. Um, just yeah. for like a reference as far as uh you know how how the film about him was made yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah, uh, I, mean, yeah I, I have to assume sorry i was I, just gonna say given he's a troubadour i wonder if there's like recordings of like reenactments of his oh. music or whatever mm. i i assume that's what a lot of the music is and mm. and i just like i also assume like a lot of the imagery like while some of it is like like nationalistic like historical armenian imagery i wonder often i'm sure some of it is directly from poems um and maybe not always the poems that are being quoted during throughout the film but yeah I, i'd be curious about that i wonder if a lot of the images that we see have root in the in the poems i think so i mean it, it seemed just from like doing cursory research on on like what the director was trying to do like he was very i mean like i said he he felt like he was the direct heir of this person to like tell this story so i think right. he was very like in tune with with the poets um with, with you know with the with the poems of this poet and like what he was trying to to kind of convey i, I do want to spend some time talking a little bit about just you know images or see or scenes from this film you know one that kind of stuck out to me was you have that sequence where he's middle-aged and he's like moving through the room and the room is just covered in sheep and there's mm -hmm. like the yeah. guy there's the old man on the bed and he's like going to like put the cloth you know he's putting the cloth over the old man but just like not even like just like how impressive that you know just visually that is but like I was just thinking of just like the 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 filming of that. Like I mean, that room is just covered in sheep. Um, oh, shit. Is there also like, or is this a different scene? Is there also like a sermon going on or something like? That? Yeah, and there's yeah. like a, there's a sermon right. going on, and this and there's just this man laying in the middle of the room on like this really and bright red bed, and there's just sheep everywhere. And I'm just like, he, like how did you shoot that scene? Like that seems insane, um, just in terms of the filmmaking you know what other scene made me think about like how the fuck did he do that um it's an exterior shot of like the castle mm -hmm. and the entire background is is like uniformly yeah, black yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's uniform yeah. like like how did you light that where did the camera go like it looked it, it looked fake whether it was day or night like like how do you how do you yeah. capture that type of like completely even lighting mm -hmm. like there wasn't any anything out of out of shape and it looked like um it looked very like dollhouse like yeah there was a lot of sequences in this that reminded me of a film we talked about uh michael we talked about i think you were on that episode last year but it's an animated movie uh the son of the white mare 
just yeah. in terms of like how like I need to see that I have it. Just, just like how every frame is just yeah. Like but there was sequences in this that felt like almost like a live action version of that where it just kind of had like this like ethereal quality to it like what you're describing to z like this just like like you're like we're like this came out of like some like spiritual like discovery outer, it's like you like shot space. in outer space you know yeah, like yeah, yeah. physics isn't the same and um it's one of the best uses of negative space that i think he ha- he uses in the movie because mm-hmm. there's lots of negative space and I can never get enough of it. Like, especially if like the color schemes are like as dramatic as the negative space. Um, I think that's really, really dramatic. Mm-hmm. It's really it's dramatic. Good. One of the things that stood out uh, to me, like as far as like sensory details go, is like obviously the visuals are incredible, but the soundscape that the movie creates mm-hmm. is amazing. And actually, one of the reasons I'm pretty sure I put this on our ballot for young critics. But one of the reasons why I was interested in this movie to begin with is that probably like six or seven years ago, the uh, musician Nicholas Jar created like a companion album to this where you oh. were supposed to be able to play the album over uh, the movie. Um, and I never knew, I didn't know what the movie was at the time. Like that's how I found out about it. And I was like, what could this interesting uh, movie be? Like, Did you do that to like, watch? No, I didn't. And I'm really uh-huh. glad I didn't because uh, the movie itself is like this really just mesmerizing soundscape. Like there's of course like the music that kind of comes in and out, but also a lot of the rest of the movie is like just rustling and like tapping yeah. and like, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like this like ASMR kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, and the very Nicholas textural. Jarrah, yeah, it's, very textural. it's super like yeah. the texture of it is just super mm-hmm. amazing. And I, I listened to it on headphones as well because it was on uh, the laptop smart. where I was watching it. Uh, and it was just like a, Really amazing, like aural experience. Um, and I'm I'm not sure if it would be improved with the Nicholas Jar album, which also does a lot of that same stuff. But mm-hmm. I kind of assumed it was going to be a silent film at first, since he had no. a companion piece to it. But I can't imagine, honestly, watching this movie without its sound. All the men stepping on food. Yeah. Oh yeah, the grapes, like the grape any, press. Yeah. yeah. Any any time, like feet, like like feet and food. You know. Yeah. It's very. Um, uh, I can't think of the word, but like you feel it, you very much feel it. Well, it opens. You have that scene. You have the person stepping on the graves, but then you have just like the kind of you don't see anybody crushing them, but like the pot. You have the pomegranates that are just being like crushed. And you kind of can just yeah. like hear like the the crunch and like see the you know see. Well, it later on, out. eating pomegranates, and it's just like mm-hmm. yeah. really, really like it's really loud. The sound of it is just incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of my favorite things is definitely textural. It's like it it is like such a wonderful image, and yeah, it's like a per- full package, which is right like again. oh yeah, similar to um, like I think it's in the same sequence where we see those books like just flapping and things like that. There's a scene of like a cl- it's like a close up of this stack of books and water is being poured down them, and it's like oh yeah yeah coming down the pages. And they're like squishing the pages so the books have become like spongy mm-hmm. and it's just so satisfying for some strange reason <laughs> or there's the scene where the guy it's where he, it's very it's very very late in the film where um the poet is like in what is like a, it's almost like a prison and there's the guy and he has like the big jugs and he's just like pouring the jugs and you can just like hear like the like the liquid i don't even know what the liquid is kind of coming out of it um no, it's it's a. There's a lot of those moments where you're just like. The sounds. Yeah, I also I also the like that there is like dialogue in it. Like in, like do you have that one scene where which is I think my favorite part of the whole movie where the old woman is talking about going to the bathhouse, um, and it's just like there's like this little spot where she's just talking about going to this bathhouse, and then her husband's just like, "Why would you say that we went to a bathhouse?" And she just goes yeah. on with her it's story. Like weird succession, like we went to the bathhouse, and then you told them that we went to the bathhouse, and you shouldn't tell them that we went to the bathhouse, and then we went and got a chicken, and then we like it's just like this weird anecdote that doesn't. It doesn't have anything there. to do with anything. Yeah, yeah. Just... They're even talking to Nova. We don't even know, like. Yeah, no, it's you like you just kind of have like these sequences where like they like whenever they do talk, it has really nothing to do with like where we're at in this in this in this wherever like it has nothing to do with what's happening. It's just like we're just going to start talking about something. Um, 
you have like the it happens a lot like in the in the last part of the movie where like the older women are just kind of talking about um the kind of uh the kind of rituals that that are taking place because i think it's at the same time when they're um they're killing the the sheep to uh to like they're they're talking they, they, they have the, the sheep like strung up and they're talking about like yeah we're gonna cook these sheep or whatever they're like yeah we're like gonna do this with the sheep they're just like it's just they it do. Has, yeah and it has nothing yeah. to do with like it's not moving it like any it's not moving any plot it's not moving any yeah. narrative it's not it has nothing to do with the poet it's just like it's just these old ladies talking about cooking the sheep that's I'm definitely like, a right. content warning uh yeah there's there's some heavy animal uh they they, they 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 kill some animals and eat them they at least they, eat them i guess but yeah it's intense yeah um, um the but, last uh, thing the last thing i did want to kind of uh, talk about as we kind of wrap up is um you know you mentioned uh i think we all kind of mentioned like it is a movie that you you definitely have to prepare yourself a little bit for mentally as you like jump into it because it's not it's not traditional in any way it is kind mm-hmm. of it is kind of very unique and singular in its own way um and so for for you all as you um were kind of tackling it for the first time i mean was there did you have to kind of put yourself in a mind you know i guess how did you set yourself up to to kind of watch the movie because i think it is one that you have to kind of prepare yourself for a little bit mentally i was honestly like life has been super stressful for me recently because i'm like a public school teacher and like yada 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 all the stuff you see in the news um about like that and covid but um so like i was sitting down to watch this movie i'm like i'm so tired and stressed and i just need to like focus on like a movie to just like take my mind off of like other stuff and then like this ended up being a really perfect movie for that because it's just just pulls you in with all like the sensory details that we've talked about and there's not Mm -hmm. like you know a lot of responsibility for your brain as far as like you know stringing together a plot if you don't want to mm-hmm. um and so that was kind of like i don't know it seems weird to say like i'm gonna unwind with some like experimental russian cinema or i guess Ar- armenian russian cinema but um like it did definitely help me like to unwind mm-hmm. um, and i found it just extremely like just soothing no, I totally agree with that. Like, I, again, I can't tr- stress enough that this is sort of the this is sort of the case with a with a with some experimental media. Like a good chunk of it, actually. Like the the misconception is that like you have to go into it with after doing like a bunch of research and like being like just so very like prepared. Like mm-hmm. something like this really is just like it's as complicated as you want to make it. It mm-hmm. can be as complicated as like a month long, like scholarly research, like watching it three times and reading about it. But or like, if you want, it's just like amazing textures and colors to experience like when you're stressed out. Yeah, I'd say like within five minutes of watching this the first time I saw it, I very much accepted that uh, like I'm just gonna experience what's happening to me and there's nothing to follow or get. And like, regardless of like what I'm, what I'm not comprehending, like the vision is undeniable. The images are undeniable. The craft is undeniable. Uh, I really like the quote he, uh, from, from Per Janov about like how he, he really felt like he was the guy to do this movie about this poet. Cause that's like, that's how you got to, uh, that's how you have to show up to make a movie like this. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't haphazardly throw this together. Like you got to really believe in the images you're putting together. And uh, no matter who you are, I think that like, if you just, if you just like accept what you're watching, like you'll see that. No, absolutely. I mean, I think, I, I think that, you know, to, to add to what everybody said, like you, you do, I, I think it is, I think it's, it's one of those movies that kind of can become, you can make it daunting if you want to, but I'm like, it's, I think you just kind of have to experience and go in and, and um, take it really just take it at face value. Like just take yeah. it at, at what value, you know, like it's not, it's not as, it's not really that complicated. You just have to, mm-hmm. you just have to kind of accept what it's giving you. Don't, don't perceive something on top of what it is. Um, 
but yeah, I don't know. I, if, if you're willing to do that, I think I, you know, this is definitely one to check out because it, it's, it's an experience, you know, it's an experience unlike anything you've ever seen. We've said that a bunch so far in this conversation. Yeah. And I, I personally think all the best art does that it operates on like both levels of like mm -hmm. super dense referential, you know, uh, heady or just like sensory, like straightforward, like, you know, experience. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, I believe that'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Cinematary, on Twitter and Instagram at handle at Cinematary, and on Letterboxd, letterboxd.com slash Cinematary, where we post all the movies that we talked about in this episode. Uh, also, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash Cinematary. Thank you so much to our patrons, Cam, Chad Newsom, Christina Daughtry, uh, Corey Willingham, Harry Eskin, Candace Sisson, Ron Hayes, Tyler Chandler, and Whitney Rio Ross. Thank you so much for your patronage. Uh, next week, we will be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movie series with 1971's Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, uh, which is nice. going to be getting a release uh, on Criterion at the end of the month. So perfect timing for that. Um, yeah. So uh, until then, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week. All right, and then the Z you should be able to push the X or the